three, two, one. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you are, and still have enough nerves to watch the crap that I'm producing over here. <laughs> this is Lucia Musa with the Freedom Alternative, and I'm here with Bob O'Hara, with whom I've been working with for what seven, seven years, years or seven so. Years, yes, and right. this is the first time we are in the same, not just on the same continent, but also in the same room together. Yes, right. Bob, welcome to my show. Welcome to the U.S. Yeah, glad to have you here. It's really wonderful. Yeah, so let's uh, let's unpack a little bit of that story. Okay, uh, we met uh, online in 2011, I yes. think it was. It was uh, when I was a guest for your show. You yes. used to do news and activism show mm. at the time. Uh, how did you perceive me at the time? Well, at the time, I, at, at, that was such an amazing time in, in my life. Uh, you know, I I had never done any kind of activism work before, and I just took an interest in men's rights. And when I started getting into it, I was so amazed that so many people all around the world were concerned about the same issues that men were facing uh, in, in all kinds of arena, especially family law and uh, you know, education, health, whatever, uh, and just just overall like criminal, you know, criminal justice uh, stuff. And I was amazed at how many people all over the world were interested in what was going on. You know how 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 many men worldwide were affected by these issues, and when you I'm trying to remember, did you call into the show one day or was there? I think yeah. we started at some point. We started some correspondence together. Yeah, it, it started a little bit earlier than that. I think it was twenty late 2010 when mm -hmm. I called into a show yes. that uh, you were not part of, but you listened uh, yes. later. And you were like, I want to have this guy on the show. Exactly, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, here's this very intelligent man from Romania that uh, has great ideas, great perception, great knowledge. And I was like, I want to get this guy on the show. And at the time, I was building a news department for A Voice for Men. And of course, you were a natural pick to be our, our um, European news director because you knew so much and you were a good writer and, and brought great material. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was actually, I was just thrilled the entire time to have you on on, on board and, and to be associated with you. Yeah, it's, so it's always been a, a fruitful that's for really me amazing to me is that this was possible I mean internet is still amazing yes uh, even to this day because mm -hmm. you know if you had told me in 1988 that you know 30 years from now you'll be standing at a table in a bar in Alexandria yeah uh, with someone who whom you've been working for the previous seven years but you had never, never met, met. Yeah. in person and I was like why no <laughs> yeah <laughs> just no no that's impossible uh. right so you mentioned men's rights so uh. Uh, that's how you got into agitation and politics? Yes, I, I got interested in the uh, area of men's rights when I was working in administration at a four-year university in Maryland. And I worked in uh, for a community college before that. And I I don't want to get into too many details as to, as to what I was doing, but I was basically a number cruncher for the school. Um, mm -hmm. I worked in a office that collected data on students survey data, financial aid data. When you go to school in this country, I think in any country, they collect a tremendous amount of data on you. And you get to see what's actually going on. Of course, the first thing that struck me is, and, and uh, even now a lot of people don't realize this, that the state of affairs for males in, in our education system, not just in post-secondary, but in secondary and primary schools, is really bad. There's a dismal retention record uh, decreasing rates of graduation for men, both for high school and university. And when I, I before getting into that as a, as a means of making a living, I just, I had no idea. It's just something that, like, the, for most people, it just doesn't occur to you that men are going to have these kinds of problems. But being in the system, I realized how much institutional discrimination was going on. It was awful. Uh, the biggest example I can remember was... The, in the STEM fields, they're trying to make it 50-50 between men and women. Um, of course, last year, I, th I think maybe, I'm sure a lot of your subscribers, people are watching this right now, remember the James Damore debacle when he wrote this really, really brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, quite moderate, I would say. Uh, well, in more than moderate. It was, very, it was generous. Yeah. But it was brilliant. It was very intelligent, backed up by science. And they, they destroyed that guy. And the basic premise was that, that men and women, on average, have differences that are innate they're inborn and because of these differences men and women choose different mm -hmm. vocations and this is a completely reasonable thing to say mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong there's nothing sexist about it it and in fact it's true 
<laughs> when I was so when you're I was, saying men and women are different. Uh huh. That's sexist. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. It's terrible. You, you can't say that. But what what's what I saw was, and this is true, in, in not just in education, but in the st in the STEM industry, in the STEM industries, uh, technology and math and uh, yeah. engineering industries, is that what was going on at the school I was working at was they were. They, they were, what was going on is the Department of Education, the U.S. government, was going to award that school $75 million if by such and such date, I think it was like within five years, they got the enrollment in STEM fields between male students and female students to be 50-50. Which, first of all, that's absurd. It's never going to be 50-50. Why, I mean, why, you know what, the, the, in, in the social sciences and in, in the, the light science, soft sciences, as they call them, like psychology, there's like the, the ratio, yes, 80, 20 percent. And, and what, and I, and I remember when my boss was telling me about this, I was like, well, don't they understand that they're, they're bribing the department heads mm -hmm. to put male students at a disadvantage? And she said, Bob, don't ever let anybody else, don't, don't ever tell anybody else that and don't ever let anybody else hear what just came out of your mouth. And I, I thought she was joking. She wasn't joking. <laughs> and was in this, and Google itself is, there's a, they've spent $700 million. $700 million to get it, to get it even steven between male and female workers as far it's as the field. And it's like, and it's like, so what's happening is there's, in, there's armies of people whose jobs are dependent on this stupid idea that men and women are the same and they're, and that if there's some difference in something, then there must be some discrimination. There must be some boogeyman out there, and it's but only if, but only if the difference f appears to be favoring men. Absolutely, because otherwise it's equality. Otherwise it's equality, and of course uh, it's gotten worse now. Of course, you know in, in, the edu the education front of uh, the men's rights battle is it's crazy. You know we we we, we know the whole like uh, Title IX, uh, dear colleague letter thing was a huge deal. Thank God that was repealed. By uh, by the Department of Education recently with the with the new administration, um, that and a whole lot of other things. Life for men, and of course, you know, you spoke with Sage Gerard; he's familiar with that whole thing. Um, yeah, by the time we publish yeah. this, the, the interview with Sage uh, was out. Yeah, yeah, sure, and, and also uh, Jonathan Taylor, who did great work for a while. It's it's really a, a huge front uh, for 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 what we do, and that's that's how I got interested in it. But then, of course, once you get into that world, once you start talking with people, you see everywhere else, like in the family of the courts, which, of course, every in this country, every man is familiar with that. And again, that's one of the subjects you, it's, it's hard to talk about because, you know, it's, it's this emotiveness of the topic of, of women and children. You just don't talk about it. Yeah, right. But it's like, Exactly. Exactly. It's uh, and but but men are just getting killed, and uh, that's gotten better. And I would like to think that we, I'd like to I'd like to think that that I, in the Voice for Men and people like you, have, have played a part in I think what what I think has become a sea change in the family court system. It's not official, but it's perceptible. I've I've started seeing judges in recent years making more responsible decisions, more equal decisions really actually looking after the best interests of the child. And I think the reason that's happened is because in the course of our activism, we really made an example out of a lot of corrupt judges uh, and, and family and lawyers and prosecutors. We really have. And we actually got mentioned in a couple of law journals saying, hey, these, these, these activists, they're not joking around anymore. Uh, if you look Mary at her, Kelly found out the oh, absolutely. The hard way. No, that was that was a real that really stood out as an example. People took notice of that. Yeah. You'll never, you, you would never think so yeah. because the press doesn't report on. Of that. course, this this wasn't in the pages of the former no, newspaper. No, absolutely but, uh, not. But I'll tell you what, there were a lot of prosecutors talking about Mary Kelly and and Jody Vaughn. In, and in you Oregon. can't talk about Jody Vaughn without mentioning a voice for men. You yeah, can't, you no, can't talk absolutely. about Mary Kellett without talking about yeah. the voice and, for men. And so and if you look at these these shop publications, these these legal publications that, that are written for lawyers, you actually see mention of this and okay. they actually and people take notice of that. Because when you start when you start doing what these people do, like Eric Hoffer once said, if you want to know what, what scares somebody, start threatening them with the same things that they threaten you with. Mm -hmm. And in this case, and it's not just feminism, but I think it's the entire left, is ruin their reputation, ruin their livelihood, 
ruin their, their relationship with their family. Expose them. Expose them for what they are. That's the biggest thing they're scared of because they know they're crooks. They know they're crooks. If you expose them, if you do that to just a few people, they take note. It really makes a difference because now the next is, you know what? This case is just like the case where these, these guys from AVFM came over and really fucked their day up. I don't want those guys to put me in their signs. And that happens. They, they, that, that actually happens. I, I know of examples where that mm-hmm. happened. There's one guy, um, who's, uh, I'm not going to say his name, but, uh, he, uh, his wife was coming after him after 20 years of being divorced. She had lost her job. She'd gotten, you know, she got down on her luck and, and she decided to go ahead and there was it, the sue for child support, even though the kids were fully grown and out of the house. And it was, I'm trying to remember the, the technicality of it, but basically this judge was siding with her and she was suing, suing for a million dollars. And during that's a phone a call, yeah, it's a lot of money. Exactly. Yeah. And, and the, the judge was fighting with her. I, I'm trying, I, I wish I, I wish I remember the details. I wish I uh, thought about this before this interview. But, um, I, uh, in, this is kind of later in my tenure with AVFM. I've been inactive for about three years now, but, uh, I, I wrote an article about this and the guy actually showed up to, to court down in Florida where, where he was, uh, I'm sorry, it was Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach where the court date was, and he didn't even know anything about it, but they had just canceled the entire thing. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, how could this, there's only one reason that this could happen is because I wrote this article about it, and I actually made sure it was distributed in the area where the judge was operating. That's activism. Every, I get really upset when, 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 especially in the MGTOW community, as much as I love MGTOW and, and love the philosophy, there's a lot of nihilism. Uh, but activism works, you know, but you just got to do it. And you just got to be patient, you know? Um, and you can make a difference. Yeah, you mentioned being patient. Uh, yes. A few hours ago, but probably a few days ago, as you are watching this, mm. I, I interviewed, I spoke with Jacob Grandstaff. You, you met him right. too. Uh, <clears throat> we were talking about the, the fact that the non left is no longer patient, is no longer playing long game. Right, yes. You mentioned having be, uh, be, being patient about it and. Uh, do it in, do, doing it constantly until you yes. see the first results. Uh, we seem to be, lo- be losing patience, and I guess the MGTOW nihilists are one example of individuals who don't I, want to even consider yeah. having being patient. And I don't want to be dismissive of MGTOW. It's a very, very important movement. It's a very important philosophy. Um, but the nihilism that it seems to harbor is this idea that you know society is gynocentric. It's, it's, it's useless. Just give up. Just disengage. Um, I like to say that, you know, do, just disengaging, becoming MGTOW alone, nothing else, is not going to stop the war on boys in education. It's not going to give men parity of reproductive rights. It's not going to stop circumcision. It's not going to stop false accusation. It's not going to make you safe from a false, false accusation of sexual assault. It's not. Being a MGTOW is not going to, because that can, that can happen to any man at any time. It wouldn't even help you as an individual. No. But, uh, as far as getting back to the patients thing, because of what we do and the nature of what we do, we're, we're going upstream in many ways. I remember what, one of the there's a an interview that I overheard uh, that uh, uh, Cafe did, uh, the Canadian Association for Equality, which is a, a brilliant men's rights group. Um, they interviewed this guy, and he said, "We're who is a men's rights activist." He said, "We're going upstream in a lot of ways. It's not just social and legal. It's." It's evolutionary. Men are biologically disposable. This is a fact of life, and this has affected the way we think about each other. It's the way we think we think about ourselves. But we have to be self-examinatory about this, and um, we have to understand that there's all the social mores that, are, that have been built around this whole gynocentrism thing that have that have put men as human beings at an extreme disadvantage. Um, it's going to take generations to combat it. But that's not that long. It, if, if it takes a few generations, fine. Um, but not only that, even if you just try, you'll see results. And to make it even uh, more, within your lifetime, to, yeah. To make it even more pragmatic, the fact, the very fact that societies 
almost as prosperous as the United States, or some of them even slightly more prosperous than the United States. They do exist whilst being slightly less gynocentric than the United right, States. Yes. Is reason enough to think that, okay, maybe we're not going to defeat gynocentrism, probably never. Uh -huh. But we can make it slightly less prevalent, yes. mm -hmm. which will inherently make life better. Yes. So that would be in and of itself a victory. Sure. It? Yes, absolutely. I mean, anything. Anything. Because you can't... Right now, in many ways, or it certainly has been for a while now, it's been intenable, really. Um, and people... Again, this is one of the things we're finding up against. When, when, you, when, you, when you take the average person and say, hey, look... There are some serious disadvantages that men are placed into, what just by being born a man, and here they are. They look at you like you got two heads or something like that, <laughs> and it takes. We're talking about patience. It can take someone some time to convince an individual, "Hey, this is what's going." On. But I've done it before. I uh, when I I because one of my biggest issues is reproductive rights for men. There should be parity of reproductive rights between men and women. It's, it's one of those things that I believe is. Not just for a men's on a men's rights standpoint, but society. It's one of the biggest problems in our society today that we don't have parity of reproductive rights between men and women. It's the thing that drives uh, fatherless for fatherlessness, that drives uh, uh, the whole um, you know, children ch children being born in poverty, all kinds of things. I mean, Not to mention the drop in fertility rate. Oh, yes, drop in fertility rate. Um, because men are disengaging, trying as hard as they can. To to disengage from reproduction because it's not in their game. There's no equality there. None. And you try to tell someone like this, especially women, but, but most men, it's like, hey, look, men don't have any reproductive rights. Men should not be able to, you should not be able to force a man into parenthood just because you had sex with them. Oh, what are you kidding? Well, they, you know, they had sex, so they, you know, they should pay the price. Well, wait a minute. So that's you, a nice pro-life argument. Yes, exactly. Idea. So what? You're one of these people that hangs so out outside, outside of, of, of abortion <laughs> clinics. You calling women whores and stuff like that? Are you one of those people? No. And they say, look, that's the same thing, except for men. Mm -hmm. They say, oh no, it's different. I'm like, no, it's not any different. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a, a very good friend who, like I, I told him this, of course, he was just as incredulous as most other people. And then, sure enough, his girlfriend, you know. Accid accidentally got pregnant, and then she took custody of the kid, and there was this huge court battle on this. And then he, at, after that, after the years of going through, he says, Bob, you're absolutely right. If I had the same rights that she had, or at least parity of rights, this whole thing wouldn't be going on right now, and my daughter would be better off than, as, as I would be better off, and I think everybody would be happier because of it, because there would be real equality. Mm -hmm. So, right. Uh, but you can convince people, you, you can show them. You, can you mentioned uh, towards the end of your tenure uh, with AVFM, so for, uh, you know, you're still in good terms with AVFM, yes. obviously. Yes, yeah, sure. Paul's but, a great friend of mine. Uh, but, you know, so you stopped uh, being so visible. So uh. what have you been up to I, I, after <laughs> you became less visible? I know that's an odd question. I got a life. <laughs> <laughs> I got a life. I, uh... I, I decided at the time, really for like the seven years that I was very active as an MRA, and I, I was very active, it was, a, it, just, it was the biggest part of my life, uh, you know, spending between 20 and 30 hours a week doing unpaid work, and it was very rewarding, I would do the whole thing over again, but it, I just got exhausted, and I, to, to put it simply and, and concisely, I needed to focus on myself, um, I needed to improve my employment situation, which I did. Uh, I need to start thinking about retirement and think about my own health. And I just decided that, at the very least, I need a sabbatical. So I, I kind of disengaged. Um, not entirely, but, you know, I still do odds and ends. I'll still do interviews like this. I'll still do errands for people. I, I helped organize a screening of the Red Pill in D.C. a couple of years ago, which was great. Um, and helped promote another one that was in Fairfax about uh, several months before that in, in, a, in a small way, but I still helped. Uh, so I still do odds and ends and things like that, but not, not high visibility stuff. Um, I, I don't write anymore. Of course, I don't do the radio show anymore. Uh, but that's, that's basically what I'm doing now. Uh, I'm still here, but I'm just not visible. And I'm kind of putting myself as a priority, which is something that, that I had needed to do around that time. It was, I just I got to the point where and there was I remember the day I just called up Paul I said Paul I just I, I can't do this like this anymore I just it's time for me to to uh, to 
focus on myself, and I have, and it's, it's paid off tremendously. My, I, I love my job. I, I like my, I like my life now better than I think I've li- liked it in a very long time, personally. Now, having said that, again, I would do the whole thing over again. Being a part of this thing and being a part of AVFM and being engaged in the kind of activism I was involved with was hands down the coolest thing I had ever been a part of. And I, I tell, I, I, I aim to tell my nieces and nephews to say, if you really want to live life, take a couple of years and find an unpopular cause and champion it because you'll meet great people and and you'll accomplish things you never thought or even possible or even possible yes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, where do you think the men's rights movement succeeded the most and where do you think the men's rights movement failed most miserably okay that's that's a great question Uh, and I think I can answer it Um, the biggest success for the men's rights movement was creating a platform, creating a place where, first of all, we challenged the narrative. We said, no, this narrative of, about gender and society and equality is wrong. We've been deliberately lied to. Here's why. Here's this. Look at these facts. Look at this, that, that, that was a one, and, and that was a bigger feat than most people realize. Uh, I, I don't think MGTOW ever could have happened if there weren't MRAs who were there first mm-hmm. to say, to, to, who were willing to get up in front of a camera or in front of a microphone or write something and say, look, here's this, 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 this is screwed up, this is screwed up. Uh, the opposition to that was intense. I mean, you know, the SPLC just recently declared us a, a, a male supremacy group, which just I heard, tickled me to death. I heard Janice <laughs> Fiamengo is uh, in and of herself a male supremacist. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So it's Christina yeah. Hoffsamos who's actually a left. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. It's yeah. amazing. But, but yeah, we're I, all male supremacists now. So. Yeah, I mean, I chalk that up as a, as a victory. <laughs> it, it means we're going somewhere. Yeah, you know? well, you know, the people who stand up for MS-13 uh, called us hateful. Well, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Exactly. That's okay. That's uh, tolerable. So we, we, first of all, we challenged this successfully. And now... There, the the discussion, and people think this is superficial. People think it's a small thing. It's not a small thing. It's a big thing. Now you can actually have a conversation about these things, and this took a while and a lot of effort to get to this point. That was our biggest thing, and then we have some other successes. I mentioned this before. I really think there's been a sea change in the family courts. It's not official, it, but it's there. It's there. We're starting to see judges make more fair also, decisions. Also, men, men's rights activists are responsible for opening up the family courts in the UK, which Absolutely. used to be yes. very serious, yes. uh, uh. secretive. <clears throat> also, German MRAs are responsible for forcing, uh, basically, almost all of Europe um, uh, fair parenting laws. I mean, continental Europe actually has it better than the United right. States, and a large part of the credit should go to Spanish and German and, to a, to a lesser extent, Eastern European MRAs. Right. I mean, th- these things have been changing. These things right. have been taking place. Uh, yeah. And yeah, again, you don't see them written in the no, the, the, the New York press Times doesn't cover and, this uh, stuff, but they but it, it happened. Yeah, it happened. Yeah, um, yeah, and so not to mention that, the whole movement in India. Yeah, holy shit, it's crazy. They India has an entire empire. Yes. of non-feminism. Like yeah, that. it's crazy. I mean, Admittedly, it, the issues they face are even harsher than the absolutely. States. What's going on in India is crazy. Yeah. but but the, the the movement over there, the guys over there, Anil Kumar is a genius. Hey, Arnil. Hey, I'll, I'll eventually come and visit you. Yes, too, <laughs> I'd like to go see him sometime soon too. Um, it, just what they've accomplished over there is incredible. I wish, and and that's that's I think when, when we were talking about failures, where the the MRM has failed in here in the West. I think that and I think this was kind of bound to happen in many ways, but it's all hope is there's certainly plenty of room for hope. We have failed to gain a perpetuity. And a continuity in our in the movement because, well, first of all, there's so much division. And, uh, there's a lot of, I mean, whenever, and really, in any movement like this, there's always people very strong personalities, people have very very uh, strong opinions, which is great. I wouldn't have it any other way. But um, we've allowed our disagreements to really become too divisive. I think, and I think there's a lot of blame to go around for that. It's not any one person. And we have also failed, and this is something we really need to, to correct. We need to figure out a way to financially 
make these things possible. Uh, there, uh, unfortunately, we live in a time where if you're, if you're gonna, if you gotta have a cause, you need professional activists. That's unfortunate. No one likes it. it. It's kind of a, it's kind of an ugly thought, like having professional athletes or whatever, like paying student athletes. But unfortunately, we just have to do it. Um, and the reasons why it fails, number one, who wants to give money to an MRA cause? I mean, when, when if, if you have if, if you have a woman who sticks her hand out and says, "Can can you help? Can, can you help homeless women in the street?" Someone's gonna put a couple bucks in it. You got some some homeless male bum on the street says, "Hey, buddy, can you give me a sandwich?" People are not as likely to do that. Yeah, because there is an inherent empathy gap. Exactly. For sure. yeah, there's no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And that's 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 our biology. It's evolution. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one of the reasons for that. But again, I think we can overcome it, and we have to. If if we're going to achieve our long time goals, but don't you think factionalism I'm, is not necessary? I mean, let me put it this way, and you'll tell me if you think I'm wrong. Factionalism can be bad, but at the same time, it's usually good from a from an ag agitation and propaganda standpoint yes. because it creates that hydra with a lot yes. of heads. Yes. So even if they do take their, if the opposition, let's say they take down, they took down Spearhead, for instance. Mm -hmm. That didn't matter. Four others sprung, sprung up. Absolutely, yes, yes. So let's say they take down AVFM for whatever reason. Right. No problem, four others will sprung up. Absolutely, there will uh, be somebody to replace Yeah. So, you know, factionalism in many ways is not necessarily, or is not inherently bad. Uh -huh. And yeah, there were divisions, because I was discussing this with Walking Mystery a few days ago, and, fa and thank you Comcast, because of Comcast, we didn't right, yeah. get to finish the, com the conversation, but you know, he was complaining about the factionalism and what, and I was about to tell him, and sadly the internet connection failed, but factionalism is not necessarily bad. I mean, yeah, sure, it fractures a lot, and sometimes it's hard to coordinate, but on the upside, it keeps the, the, the propaganda engine uh, rolling even in the harshest conditions. Yeah. Whereas I, if you have something monolithical and unified, like now, or at least, imagine if if, right. the, if there had been no factionalism in now, right. we would have destroyed feminism a long time ago. Yeah. But because they had factionalism, and they, you know, the Rad Femmes separated over the tranny issues, and the right. <clears throat> uh, traditionalist, uh, well, more traditional feminists separated over the, the um, I don't know, uh, divorce, uh, the uh. right of rape, or whatever. And because they had factionalism, they were able to create the hydra that we're now fighting against. Right. Yeah. And as a result, they've been able to survive a lot longer than even their allegedly legitimate expiration date. Right. I, I think feminism's expiration date passed in 1852. I, but I, yes. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that's, that's, that's a really interesting... Th that's a really interesting thought. Um, factionalism in the MRM, of course, there's a, the class thing of MGTOWs and pickup artists and, and people who actually call themselves MRAs who are interested in changing laws and whatnot. Um, Without a doubt, it's gotten us a lot of publicity. <laughs> for sure, yeah. the factionalism itself, uh, and the the willingness to try to paint every single MRA as a PUA and paint every single MGTOW as a crazy alt right, woman hating, never has sex type person. That when people, when you start getting targeted and when people start using your frac your the factionalism. When they, when people in the mainstream media start trying to use the factionalism against you, it oftentimes gives you more attention than they really want you to get because they think they're trying to deflect people away. Well, the people don't work like that. People are way smarter than the mainstream media thinks they are. When they start, when the mainstream media starts pointing at somebody and, and you know screaming like you know the people invasion the body snatchers, you know I don't know what movie, movie you're talking, what do you think I'm, I'm talking about, but uh, it, it, when they start pointing at people and screaming and yelling. Other people are going to say, why is that person screaming and yelling at that person? Why is that person trying to get me to, to hate this person? That's a positive thing. And I think the factionalism in the men's rights movement, I think you have a good point that, yes, that can be a good thing because it makes people investigate. Not to mention that, you know, uh, as much as I disagree a lot, especially with the, you know, the people in the pig tau cult, let me put it this yes. way. Mm -hmm. As much as I disagree with them, I enjoy the fact that they exist. Oh, absolutely. Because yes. the re if they exist, I can go full agit prop on the normies and, the, yes. and just say, look, you're either going to listen to me mm -hmm. or you're going to have to deal with those guys. Yep. And that ain't going to be pretty. Yep. 
And, you know, that it is in, in a way emotional blackmail, but yes. it, it also allows me and other people like me and like yourself to appear a little bit more moderate, sure. even though what we propose is in many ways quite radical, but it appear, it makes us appear more moderate. It's, look, mm -hmm. you're either going to deal with me or you're going to have to deal with those guys. Right. And, you know, at, at least, you know, I'm saying let's just change a few laws and abolish a few others. And right. that's pretty much it. That's my end game. But if you don't deal with me, you're going to deal with those guys whose end game is the collapse of an entire civilization. Yeah. So, you know, what's it going to be? That's a tactic that's called moving the middle. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's a tactic predominantly used by the left, but I'm, see, I'm thinking it, and I've, I've seen it working, used for non-leftist causes uh. as well, provided that you have a boogeyman. And, yeah. the, you know, it, it, was, it was first deployed by animal rights activists, uh, the same people that had the moderate animal rights activist organization, the same people who were also funding the ALF, the Animal right. Liberation Front, which was a terrorist organization. Uh. And then they employed the same tactic. Look, you're going to either deal with the moderates or you have to deal with the ALF. So that's how they moved the middle. The uh, compromised position was already in extremist territory. Right. Yes, I and I think the same thing can be applied here. And I've seen it applied in, uh, in several places. Right. Uh, you know, for instance, with, uh, in Romania, when I called uh, city halls and said, look, uh, I heard that last year you gave to the feminists uh, for, for March 8th 15,000 euros uh, subsidy. Well, I'm with a voice for men. I want 15,000 euros for yeah. November right. 19th for the International Men's Day. Yes. And they're like, oh, we can't afford it. And I'm like, okay, there are two options here. Either I sue you into oblivion until you pay me double that, right. or you stop giving money to the feminists and everyone goes home because I don't actually need your money. I don't care about your subsidy. Right. Yeah. You can all go fuck yourselves. And that allowed the radical position of let's defund feminists to appear a lot more moderate Absolutely, than yeah. it actually was. And, you know, feminists then had to contend with the fact that there's no more subsidies for them. Uh, so... That, that's why I love when such extremists exist. Right. Yes. Uh, even though I don't agree with them, uh, because sometimes I get, oh, why? why for instance, well, it, when, when Rouge V says something right. stupid, I get, oh, but you know, have you seen this guy saying such? And, and, yes. you, and you said you appreciate him. And I'm not, he, I, he can be useful sometimes. Yes, I appreciate his existence. Mm -hmm. I don't have to agree with everything. I don't have to agree with anything he says. No. But the fact that he's there. Yes. Is inherently progress. Yes. At least for a while. Now, of course, there may come a time when the existence of such people could be dangerous. But I don't think that's going to come during my lifetime or right. even my children's lifetime. Right, yeah. It's probably going to be a lot later down the road. I, I, I don't think he's ever, him or any of the PUAs ever going to be as, as dangerous as in reality as MRA is personally. <laughs> that's what I think to, to our opponents, to the mm -hmm. people who are actually mm -hmm. are against us. Uh, I, I think that the but but I appreciate you're right. I'm, I'm with you. I appreciate their existence, their pers the, their the ba the fact that they are perceived to be what they are, mm -hmm. a as they are perceived, it is useful for us. Yeah, another we can interesting bring ourselves thought. Yes. As moderate. Yes. Now let's go a little bit to more general politics. Okay. Uh, I, I presume you're comfortable to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we. Not just we, but you know, in general, there, there, it has been alleged by the Pravda on Hudson, by the Washington Compost, and all uh, the other right, yes. uh, drive-by media, as yes. my, mm -hmm. my friend from Chicago calls them. Uh, we've been accused of being partially responsible for a surge in hate yes. in this country, but more importantly, as being one of the decisive factors, or at the very least, one of the uh, mar or one of the factors for sure of this new administration right, uh, right. existing in the right. first place. Now, first of all, do you really think that we are? And second of all, if we are, so what? Yes. Okay. So, first of all, and I got to say, this is this this country, the population in this country has, has, has taken a turn to the right. We've had eight years under the Obama administration. Uh, of course, the, the Democratic Party has gotten more and more insane over the past 30 years. Um, the left went from caring about the average man, the working man, the working family, making sure everyone gets a fair shake or, or a fair opportunity, and if, if there's a way we can help, then we should do it. That's what the left in this country used to be about. It has become more now about identity politics. It's become about division. It's become a, about uh, condescension. And Americans, just by their nature, are not like that. And they're so much smarter than uh, than what these people give them credit for. Way smart. Uh, and I think that's the biggest factor. The biggest factor for the turn to the right for, for the, the electorate in this country is the left itself. 
they become politically. Nobody, sp- nobody recruits for the right no. better than the no. Far far they, 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 and they, and they, and 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 people saw they were taking. They, they took control of the Democratic Party, and not only that, the party leadership became incredibly corrupt, and people saw it. They didn't even try to hide it after a while. They just, they just didn't even try. That's the reason why we've. That's that's the biggest reason why we've had this turn to the right in this country. Now, as far as um, our part in it, I think that the men's rights movement, first of all, we, our opponents are feminists. Our main target of criticism is feminism and feminists. Uh, the hypocrisy, the the fact that it's a statist ideology, uh, the fact that they don't believe in, in equality between the sexes. It's, they've never been about equality. Um, we started to actually point that out. And of course, that made us a. T- and of course, feminism, as as you would agree, I'm sure anybody, most people watching this would agree, uh, is a tool of the far left. And when I say the far left, I don't mean like free education or free healthcare. No, uh, I, mean, less, I mean left towards from key things. Yes. I really when I say left, I mean like the the people who want to have the state control everything. Feminism is a statist ideology, and feminism is a tool of that whole cabal of people. Um, I think that that we were a radical example of a bunch of ordinary people, ordinary people who who behave normally, who think normally, who saw something crazy and pointed it out, and by doing so, it was kind of like parachuting into DMB Enfu. We we became part of the craziness, you know. We, it's all of a sudden we didn't realize how crazy it was going to be, and there it was. <laughs> So it was this huge. It was like it was like a political grenade that went off in this in this environment. And I think in some ways, uh, because this the men's rights movement really started heating up around two thousand nine. That's even when, though it's been around for more than for, years. oh, absolutely. But things there was something around two thousand seven, two thousand eight, two thousand nine where you could definitely tell something was happening. Ordinary people were talking to each other online. People who never would have spoken to each other any other way. Who never would, and they did the the. the diversity of these people and the energy was just there was something electric about it and I think in some ways the MRM probably more so than any other conservative group or what, 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 what would be what, yeah, what, or what, the, what the left would call the alt-right even though I think it's a completely manufactured term um, uh, kind of was the beak that kind of broke through the shell it, maybe in some ways it was just like just that little bit even though it was small it, it, I think it had a, the footprint or the beak print, I think, was significant enough to where it was kind of like, hey, if there's like, you know, a few hundred thousand people who like are championing these issues and, and maybe several thousand who are actually leaders in this movement doing that, what else can we do with, with other non-leftist movements? I mean, it just, I think, I, I would like to think that. Maybe I'm patting myself on the back too much, but we really did do something very, very different. Um, and I, I think very courageous. At least in the, in the 21st century, it was not the first, but the biggest attempt of a non-leftist project to use so-called left-wing methods. Yes. To use agitation. Absolutely, to use, yes. <clears throat> to use rules for radicals, to, to yes. force the enemy to live up to his own book of rules. Is it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we did. It, it was the, did. the most successful one, at least in the first few years of the new century, and yes. especially at the earlier in this decade. Right. Now, of course, others have come around and made it even better and faster and uh-huh. bigger, but it was one of the first ones that actually succeeded. Yes. Right. Or uh, succeeded in not being completely obliterated yeah, by the left. Yeah, not just, 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 just having the fact that we're still around yeah. is amazing. I mean, and if you think about the opposition and the craziness. And the funding. And and the, oh, and the stuff. money. Oh, my yeah. God. And we, we're like impoverished people. I mean, yeah. we couldn't be more. We are the, the, gr- the, the most grassroots type of organization you could possibly imagine. We couldn't be more normal or average person. Mm-hmm. You just couldn't be. And look what we were, we, we were up against, and we're still around. We're still here. I mean, think about all the censorship and the you know people having their lives destroyed. And people people had lost their careers. They've lost their families. Uh, they've had their reputations ruined. I mean, you know, but we're still here. And I think that in itself is a victory. And I think it served as an example for a lot of other people who who had, who had different interests. Mm.
but it's still the, the enemy's still the same. It's it's this the, the leftist establishment, and it's a worldwide establishment that we're up against, and they're losing now. They're losing now, and I that's. That to me, I think that's a, a tremendous. No, that's what was that what I was about to ask. How do you see the next several years? Oh, here in this country, I, 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 I'm going to speak for this country because here's what I, what I think is going to happen. The Democratic Party, and we could we could talk about Trump, we could talk about things, but this whole thing is so much bigger. This is the other thing that the left doesn't realize. This whole thing is so much bigger than Donald Trump. Yeah. These people are obsessed with this one individual. Okay. But he's just representative of a real sea change in the way people are thinking politically in this country. Um, so I think what's going to happen is, first of all, the American people have woken up. Not all of them, but enough to make a difference, obviously. And I think this is going to be carried on through the midterm elections uh, and maybe in the next pre presidential election. The reason why it's going to be carried through, the reason why I think it, it's going to be changed even more, is that the left in this country literally doubled down on the same bullshit that lost them the presidential election. They nominated the most corrupt politician in American history for president. The, the wor I mean, just the worst. I mean, I think about the Democrats back in the 80s. I mean, if they thought that, that the Democratic Party was going to nominate like Tip O'Neill and Pat Patrick Moynihan, these guys were respectable people. They were leftists, but they were respectable people who had ideas, who could argue with people, and who, who didn't they were respectable too. They were, they were respectful too. They, they, I mean, you know, uh, Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill could go and have a beer with Ronald Reagan at the end yeah. of the day, and they could talk about things, and they could work things out, even though they vehemently disagreed on things. The left in this country and the Democratic Party have has abandoned all of that, and they're going to pay the price. And I think it's going to be a decades long price of a lot of Republican governorships, a lot of Republican congressional seats. And I think presidency. So I think for, I, I really think that the left has screwed itself in this country. Now that being said, there is a huge, a significant, if not huge, part of the population that has been indoctrinated. They, they, we will never convince them that socialism is bad, no matter no matter what the bloody one hundred year history of socialism is. You'll never convince them that you know, hey, look, you know, Trump is not some Nazi. People who happen to be conservatives, they're not bad, evil people. We just have different ideas about the way things should be. Uh, and if, and you know, maybe if you want to, if you want the Democratic Party to have more influence, maybe you should like, you know, expel Antifa from your ranks and and start holding your leadership more accountable. You know, but they maybe they, get rid of some of the anti-Semites. Yes. You know, yes. Maybe get rid of yes. some of the actual Bolsheviks. Yes. Uh, get, get rid of these crazy people, and because you know what, it, it, no one's convinced. And but you know, unfortunately, there's a, a through our education system and through our media in this country, they've succeeded. And this was their goal: was to indoctrinate a, a much, as much of the public as possible into this idea that that we are a country based on oppression. Uh, and the only way to expunge ourselves of this guilt is to go full out socialism. There are, there are, I think, far too many people in this country that honestly believe that. And I know some of them. Uh, you know, there are people, and, and unfortunately, I think they'll never, ever stop thinking that way. Many people will not stop thinking that way. But, but I think their numbers are not enough. Their voices are very loud. You would think there are more of them than there are. But they're not, and a lot of those people will eventually change their minds. There's there is definitely a a swell of concern in the right. When I'm, I'm thinking about the organizations like PragerU, uh, the Heritage Foundation, all I'm these. Meet, I'm gonna meet Dennis Prager in about three weeks. Oh, wonderful! Yeah. Tell him I'm a big fan. Yeah, yeah. But these, but but what they're doing is they're they're starting to think, hey. We can't just sit back and let these people have the narrative. We have to present. And they're doing so in such a fabulously ar articulate way. And this is why they're so hated by love. This is why YouTube is censoring these people. It's because they're, they're articulate. They're, they can convince people, and they are. Yeah. So I think we're at this, I think we're definitely at the start in this country, at least, to a, a, a shift to the right. And I think, despite what you may see on TV or, Despite what many journalists and political pundits might tell you, I think we're going to become a more sane country politically, I think, in the next 20 years. There's still going to be crazy people out there, but I, I'm 
I'm more optimistic about our future now than I have been in probably the previous since, decade. Yeah, since I've uh, longer, f fifteen years. Yeah, I'm I'm very optimistic. And again, it's not it's not about Donald Trump. No. As much as people want to make oh it's Trump, yeah, he's just it's it's something bigger than that. Yeah, people in this country are fed up. I, but this again. If they I mean, impeach Trump, you know, it, Pence is coming up. Yeah, right. Uh, and if they impeach Pence, there are a lot of other yeah, ones. Like yeah, they think they there. think that Trump's the only guy. They think he's like Darth Vader or something yeah, like no, that. No, you kill him, then everyone dies. Yeah, no. Or, or like you know, if you if you melt the Ring of Doom, then then they all die. No, 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 no. It no, doesn't no, work. No, like it doesn't that. work. That. Yeah, but you know, this is very progression. Uh, uh, projection basically because they are collectivistic and if you melt some of their leaders uh -huh. a lot of them defect but it's not the same and they think we function the same and we don't we don't we, don't. we just don't I mean you know, I've been around here before before uh, just on YouTube I've been around before Tr Donald Trump announced his uh, uh, candidacy I'll be here long after Donald Trump yeah, will sure. not be a yeah. uh, uh, president and uh, I'll, I'll still be thinking most yeah. of the things that I'm thinking now Probably I'll change my mind on some issues because you know that's normal in a way. This is a, yeah, and I say look at look at in this country again. I'm just speaking for this country. Look at look at what's happening in Congress. The people who are, the the conservative people who are getting elected to Congress, who being who are getting elected to governorships, even local elections and, mm -hmm. and local legislatures. Mm -hmm. It's there's the what's going on, and this is what the left doesn't realize. It's it's a sea change in the way the people in this country are thinking, and. They haven't gotten it. They just haven't gotten it. They just don't. It's it, and it's it's going to screw them up. It's, in long term, it's going to screw them up. Yeah, because I was uh, uh, even just today in D.C. I, I was telling that to Jacob too. That there's, I was as I was queuing for coffee. There was a family of obviously immigrants, either Venezuelans or Colombians, mm -hmm. uh, judging by the accent. They were speaking uh, Spanish with I think it was Colombian accent. And you know the guy, the head of the family, if you, if I'm if I'm allowed the patriarchal yeah, sure, assumption, the patriarchal family, yeah. um, you know, had a, a MAGA hat on and yeah, uh, sure. but the American flag on, and I'm like, the left is so bloody out of touch. Oh, well, it's the same thing with the with the black community here in the U.S. <laughs> it's it's changing like dramatically. Yes. I was about to tell you that the, the, uh, yes. a, a few uh, l last week, basically, I was I went I went into several. You know, less than less than cushy uh, mm. areas of Chicago, mm. and I got a chance to speak with probably a dozen people over a course of a day. Yeah, right. Uh, the sample, I, I don't think the sample was tainted, but you know, eleven out of twelve uh, oh, yeah. were like, yeah, you know, we didn't go with Trump in 2016, but we might. In yeah, it's right. Yeah, well, what's happening is is people these in in the African American community. They have, for a very long time, always looked to the Democratic Party as the party for economic opportunity for them. That promise has been completely reneged. It's been completely voided. It, it became obvious that black people weren't, they didn't benefit under Obama. They haven't what, been, you, you mean the party of the Ku Klux Klan? Lied? Yeah, exactly, right, yeah. Oh, and and, 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 so and but, but beyond that, that they're, they're starting historically to wake up. They're like, yeah. look, the left has never been our friend. Yeah. And here's this Donald Trump guy who, ah, okay, he's some, you know, rich, white, real estate uh, developer from the Bronx, you know. Every, he, he is the archetypal rich, white guy, you know. But he made all these campaign promises. He said, you know, the Democratic Party's abandoned you people. I'm going to bring jobs back. I'm going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And enough people listened to him and believed him for him to get elected. Just barely. Now he's really following through more than any other president in my lifetime. On his campaign promises, people look at that. They're like, "Hey," and and the African American community is watching this. Yeah, it's, it's the and they're, they're, and the thing is, there is another thing. There's there's such a this identity politics thing worked for a short while on most of the African American. Yeah, identity politics. It's not working for, that much. Apologies for interrupting, but uh, identity politics is one of the first time in recent history when the left. Actually, employ the short-term tactic instead yes. of looking at the long game. Yeah. It was a huge mistake. It was a huge mistake. Yeah. You can you can fool like a bunch of young people mm -hmm. for a little while about that, but eventually, and they turn people, thirty, they start paying well, taxes. Well, they turn, but not only that. Well, they start paying taxes, but not only that. It's it's like for me, I'm forty-seven. We'll be forty-seven in a, in a couple of weeks now. I remember back in a time, back in the seventies and eighties, which were supposedly more racially charged, where the average black 
man didn't look at the average white guy that way, you know? It was like, hey, we're, we're both Americans, you know? I, I remember I, was, uh, I saw a uh, YouTube video of Marvin Gaye singing the national anthem, and they had interviewed him before. He actually sang the national anthem at an NBA game, and he came out, of course, Marvin Gaye, he's a beautiful vocalist, marvelous entertainer, uh, sang this just tear-rendering version of the national anthem. And in the pre the interview prior to him going out and singing that, he was saying, you know, most people just don't understand how lucky we are, lucky we are to be in this country. It was, he was really a patriotic person. He expressed it both in 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 his interview and in singing the national anthem. Nowadays, it's uncool for black people to think that way. Now, now black athletes kneel on the knee when they sing the national anthem, and it's like, what's? And, and it's all it's all. 90% of it is just manufactured by the left. And, again, the whole kneeling at football game is stupid. These are overprivileged people saying that they are somehow oppressed. oppressed. Millionaires, come on, people, come on. You know, first, that's, that's the number one thing. Number two, most Americans are sm they're smart enough not to fall for that. They see what's going on. It works for a short time. But it was completely manufactured. This whole thing started in the 1990s on college campuses. Eventually, went into the to the news media and the entertainment media. That will work for a short time, but eventually, people will see it for what it is—a divide and conquer strategy, strategy by people who want to control everybody, who who definitely want two classes of people: the people in charge and the people who are not in charge. And it's it's it really is a. And you're right. It was it was a stupid. Strategy, by the way. And especially now, if you look at, it, for instance, unemployment numbers, I mean, it, it's the lowest. Uh, I, is it the lowest uh, African American yes, unemployment yes. since uh, the since five. since the, since forever? Uh -huh. Yes. Oh, okay. Since well, well, since, since, since they've been since they've been recording. Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. And and it, it it's and that's, that's gonna everybody. Make a dent. Oh, that's gonna ah, make a dent. Well, I mean, it's just like that's always been the huge concern mm -hmm. for the African American community. Yeah, They've always been behind. Yes. Well, now we need more. There it is. Yeah. All of them are what, you give people tax cuts and the, you cut the corporate tax rate and people start getting jobs again? What? Who, Who would have thought? thought? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, and, and, it's, it's, and it's, it's really it's fascinating to see. And it's something, if you asked me, if you told me five, six years ago that this would be happening, I, I wouldn't believe you. Mm. All right. Uh, so uh, I, it's obviously that you've been following things, even though you've been disengaged. Yes. I so I gotta ask this: uh, Where do you see Robert O'Hara in the next three, four years? Well, Robert O'Hara is never gonna be the 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 crazy person that's that's working two part-time jobs uh, and spending a lot of time writing interviews and chasing people down and and running around doing crazy stuff ever again. He's too old for that. Uh, but I, I am, I, at some point, I know I need to get back into the game. It's something I, I've been thinking about for a long time. What, what I, if I'm going to do something, it's going to be my own. I'm kind of torn between getting back into some kind of radio show thing, which I really enjoyed. It was so much fun. Um, or maybe getting into some legislative activism, which I also really enjoyed, which I think now there's more reason to be hopeful about that now. Uh, than there ever has been. At least you won't be talking with this kind of wall like this. Yes, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so maybe, but uh, either way, um, either way, I think that uh, there's just so much room for so many more people to come in and do what we're doing right now, and it's it's happening right now, not just in the MRA arena, but in, in many other arenas. And uh, I'm, I don't know. I'm more than anything else. I'm having fun sitting back and watching the world go by and seeing mm -hmm. things happen and, and having some sense of satisfaction that 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 I kind of played a part in that. Um, but uh, I don't know. Where do I see myself in the next few years? I, I think just time will tell, really. And I hate. I'm, I'm sorry to put it to you that way, but oh, I, that's fine. I yeah. was hoping to get you to promise that you're gonna build. I, a huge I, I, I can't make any promises right and... now. I, <laughs> I was but hoping you're gonna build, you build a huge lobby for uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, right. Yeah, and there's anything else that we didn't cover that you would like to? No, I think that's it. You know. Nah. All they're, right. They're they're gonna open up the bar pretty soon, so we gotta get out of here. Well, you 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 ruined the secret. <laughs> I was sorry. I was hoping that. Oh, it's damn okay. it, man! It's okay. All right, let's All right. go have some beer. Okay, sure. Uh, All right, man. So, thank you for coming Absolutely. to my show. It's so nice. And to see uh, you. I hope we get to see uh, each other again quite soon. Soon, yes. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all soon as well. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>